Feast of Tabernacles, which we will have on the overhead very soon, and how the God had commanded through Moses and the book of Leviticus and other scriptures how the Jews were to celebrate three groups of feasts every year. And these groups of feasts were prophetic of what God was doing and would continue to do for his people. The last of the feasts, the greatest feast, was called the Feast of Tabernacles, or the Feast of Harvest, the Feast of Ingathering, Feast of Booths. They had a number of names. But it was a time of remembrance for the Jews, for what God had done to bring them out of Egypt. It was the time of joyful harvest. It was the, at the end of their agricultural year. Uh, they're actually celebrating it this week. From last Sunday to next Sunday, it's the Feast of Tabernacles in Israel. It's the end of their agricultural year. They've had their fall, harv their fall harvest, where here you're maybe just starting your spring planting, planting right? It's, uh, it's the other way around. But they were having a joyful harvest, the Feast of Ingathering, and it was a prophetic hope because the Feast of Ingathering of their natural harvest was also prophetic of the harvest of the Lord and how the Lord was going to redeem a people from every nation, tribe, people, and tongue unto himself. And so we can study in the book of Leviticus that the Feast of Tabernacles was the last feast in Leviticus 23, and it's rather long to read it. You can study it, and I'm sure some of you are probably skilled in teaching it. But we're just having a short remembrance tonight on this Feast of Tabernacles when the Lord had them build booths or tents every year. They were to leave their house for seven days, build a little uh, tent, teepee, hut, uh, booth, tabernacle outside of their homes, uh, put a bunch of branches on top, and live in it for those days to remember how they had been pilgrims from Egypt up to the promised land, but how the Lord brought them in and planted them in the land of their inheritance. And so the Israelites celebrate it by building little booths outside of their homes. Or if they live in a city and there is no land to use, they can get more creative and out on their little uh, places where they would normally dry clothes in the, in the apartments, they would instead construct a booth that was outside, okay? And there they would uh, celebrate the Feast of Booths. Now, if they didn't even have that much, they could get more creative, and they could just plop it on the back of their, of their little truck or something, okay? But they were celebrating the goodness of God, what God had done for them, what God was doing, and what God would do. And for us, as Christians, this feast commanded to the Israelites, while we do not naturally celebrate it, it is full of spiritual significance for us. And there are several fulfillments of this feast that, were, uh, ha that happened in the earthly life of our Lord Jesus Christ, and as our pattern, what should also happen in our earthly lives. We know that in John Chapter 1, verse 14, the scripture talks about the word of God who was with God and was God and how the word became flesh and tabernacled among us is the correct word in the Bible. Dwelt, yes, but he lived in a tabernacle. He lived in a booth just as the Israelites were to go outside of their comfortable home and remember how there were the days of sojourning coming up to the promised land, so even God himself did not think it something that had to be grasped, that he would remain in his heavenly home. But he emptied himself. He left his heavenly glory. And the word of God tabernacled among us and became a baby in Bethlehem. What a marvelous wonder for us to consider. And as he tabernacled among us, there was also the time at the Mount of Transfiguration that many Bible scholars feel was 
uh, happened at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. Remember, Pe Peter said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. We'll build three booths for you and Elijah and Moses. Well, why was that on his mind? It was probably the Feast of Tabernacles when that happened. And he who dwelt among us, veiled in flesh, yet he was still God incarnate. And he revealed himself in that time of prayer as his face shined brighter than the sun. And the impact of seeing the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ so impacted Peter that near the end of his life, he wrote in his epistle that we did not follow cunningly, cunningly devised uh, stories and fairy tales concerning the coming of our Lord, but we were eyewitnesses of his glory. And John merely said near the end of his life in his gospel, and we beheld his glory. Oh, if we can see in the time of our tabernacling the glory of God that was revealed in Christ and is the hope of glory for each one of us who has Christ in us, that there is that coming revelation of the fullness of God's purposes. We won't always just tabernacle as pilgrims and strangers in this world, but there is a coming time when the glory of the Lord shall be fully revealed. And then in John chapter 3, verse 37 through 39, we have the, uh, the scriptures telling us the story of when Jesus went to Jerusalem at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles. And in John 7, 37, it said that in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. But he promised on that last great day of the feast, when the Jews had the high priest pour a little bowl of water out on the threshold of the temple, symbolizing from Ezekiel the river that began as a trickle from the temple, but that river that would grow greater and greater, a thousand cubits, it would be ankle deep, another thousand, it would be knee deep, it would become thigh deep, it would become waters that could not be passed over, that Jesus was saying the fulfillment is not just pouring water out of a bowl at a stone temple in Jerusalem, but that out of our innermost beings, there will be rivers of the Holy Spirit that are going to be released. When? It says we believe in Jesus, but this was prophesied. It would also be at the Feast of Tabernacles. At the end of the Jewish year, prophetic for us, the end of the Christian age. And so we are looking forward to much greater revelations of these things coming to pass. And the Feast of Tabernacles, as we mentioned, is also the Feast of Harvest, of Gathering. From Exodus 23, 16, Leviticus 23, and other scriptures. And it prophetically speaks of the last revival and harvest of the church age. Could we have another? Okay. And so we can read in James chapter 5, as James was prophesying, he said, Therefore be patient, brethren, James 5, 7, until the coming of the Lord, the second coming. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting till it receives the early and the later rain. You be patient, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Before the coming of the Lord, there would be the former rain and then the later rain in Israel, the early spring rains, and then the rains that got the harvest ripe. In the church, we had the early rain when the church began and God poured out his spirit. But now we are in the last days of the church, in the time of the latter rain. And in the time of the latter rain, it is to prepare the full harvest. 
And so we read there that the coming of the Lord is like the farmer waiting for the time of the full harvest. And what will be the full harvest for us? Well, in Matthew 24, 14, we can read the prophecy of our Lord. He said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world to all nations, and then the end will come. And so we want to look forward expectantly to the fulfillment, the spiritual fulfillment in the church of what the Jews celebrate at the end of every one of their years of what God has done for them. Them in the natural, us in the spirit. Now, the Jews celebrate this feast with great joy. Okay. It was in the time of Nehemiah, you can study in Nehemiah 8, whenever you've got time, that they gathered together in the eighth month. It was the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, and Ezra the priest read the law of the Lord. They worshipped for a fourth of the day, and it says that the people were weeping when they heard the words of the Lord, because they saw how far short they had fallen of God's purposes. And yet God was restoring them. They were being rebuilt. Nehemiah had come, and they had rebuilt the walls. God was with them in preparing the way for the first coming of Christ. And so Nehemiah told them, yes, we've fallen short, but, but God is helping us. God is lifting us up. God is preparing us for much greater things. And so we have the scripture that we've probably sung ten zillion times about weep not, for the joy of the Lord is your, is your strength. And this was spoken on the Feast of Tabernacles by Nehemiah. And with the encouragement of Ezra and the priests when there was revival, restoration. And we want to have great joy and revival and restoration. Now in our day, the Jews are still celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles with great joy. I'd like to, if, if I could wear black and kind of blend in, I don't know, I'd have to grow my beard an awful lot longer. You know, I, I might enjoy jumping into one of those celebrations there. But the Jews, we know in the scripture, Paul said in, in the book of Romans, they are partially blinded, but not fully blinded. They are outside of the covenant, the new covenant right now, but they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. God is still working in the nation of Israel. He has regathered them in modern times. He is turning their hearts back to God. He is preparing the church for the coming of Christ. He's preparing the Jews for the coming of their Messiah. And they have great joy and celebration, even though they know only, only a little bit of the light of God. How much more we who see the fullness of what God is doing should be celebrating in what God is doing in our days, gathering the nations back to Christ, restoring the nation of Israel, bringing in a harvest, bringing the gospel throughout the world. What rejoicing we should have far above the Jews. This feast, which is now starting to be fulfilled at the end of the church age, will also find a greater and lasting fulfillment when Christ returns. Because we can read in the book of Zechariah, chapter 14, about the second coming of Christ, how the Messiah, his feet, will, will, he'll, he'll come down and stand on the Mount of Olives, on the eastern side of Jerusalem. He will destroy the armies that are attacking Israel and uh, bring peace and salvation to the Jews waiting for their Messiah. But then it says in Zechariah 14, 16, it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem, they shall go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. When Christ returns to rule the world from his international capital of Jerusalem, every year at the Feast of Tabernacles, signifying the feast of the ingathering, of the full harvest being gathered, there will be ambassadors, there will be those from every nation that will go to Jerusalem 
and there they will stand before the presence of Jesus Christ as he is in Jerusalem. They shall worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now in modern days, the Christian churches from around the world are gathering at the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem. This was a picture of last year when every year there are thousands that come. It's actually the biggest event in Israel every year. The, the Jews praise the Lord when the Feast of Tabernacles comes. All the hotel owners, because their hotels will be stuffed full. All their restaurants are happy. They're going to, they're going to make, make a lot of money off of all the, the Christians gathering in. And the mayor of Jerusalem comes and greets uh, uh, gives a speech to the Jew, f to the Christians who have come. Thousands. The biggest event every year is the pilgrimage of Christians from around the world. But this is only the beginning. It's just the glimpse of what we are going to see when Jesus reigns in Jerusalem and all the nations will go to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, uh, we and our uh, Filipino brethren have a beloved uh, sister, her name is Beulah Badwa. She's been to Israel umpteen zillion times and uh, leads tour groups there. And she was over in Israel and Jerusalem at one Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, a Jew came up to her and said, uh, you're an Asian, right? And she said, yes, I'm a Filipina. And the, and the person said, uh, and you came for the Feast of Tabernacles now? And she said, yes, I have come to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles here in Jerusalem. And the person said to her, he said, there is a prophecy that we Jews have had for time unknown, that when the Gentiles, when the foreigners start to come to Jerusalem at the Feast of Tabernacles, the coming of the Messiah draws near and so it's a testimony every year when thousands of Christians from around the world with nations and flags from around the world gather and march through the streets of Jerusalem. It's a testimony. It's a wake-up call to the Jewish people. It is the nearing of the Messiah. It is the time for the fullness of the feast of ingathering of believing Jews and Gentiles that will partake of the coming kingdom of God. And in that kingdom, there will be the great joy of the kingdom of God. We will have the lion lying down with the fatling, the wolf and the lamb dwelling together. And the scripture in Isaiah saying, for the earth will be filled with the knowledge of of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. This will be the Feast of Tabernacles celebrating for 1,000 years the works of God when the whole world will be at peace as Micah prophesied that the nations will not lift up sword against nation and they will not, no more learn war. There will be the goodness and the glory of God filling the earth in the coming kingdom of God. And as we recognize these things, as we recognize what God has done for us in the past in saving our souls and, and, and spreading the gospel more and more to the ends of the earth. This is one of the ends of the earth, right? More and more to the ends of the earth. Then the coming of the Messiah draws near and we should celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, what it means in our hearts, what Christ has done, what he's doing, the rivers of living water that we want to see arising to become a river through the church of Jesus, the soon fulfillment of the Great Commission, and the 1,000-year fulfillment of the Feast of Ingathering, when Jews and Gentiles and all the world will dwell together in peace and unity and prosperity as Jesus reigns as the King of Kings from Jerusalem. Now the Jews celebrate this feast with great joy and they only understand a little of its significance. How much more we should be a rejoicing people. Amen? How much more we should be able to celebrate the goodness of God and what God is doing and what a privilege it is that we are living in these last days. 
when it is time for the gospel to spread through the whole earth and prepare the way for the soon coming of Christ. Hallelujah! Hallelujah!